So warm welcome to Researchers Desk. It is a great pleasure to welcome Thomas Hamm from Stockholm Resilience Centre, who's kindly agreed to give us an extra seminar today. And Thomas is going to talk to us about the Climate Assembly for Sweden. And we're really looking forward to listening to you, Thomas. Thank you very much for being here. I'm going to turn my camera and microphone off. I am behind the scenes and ready to be called upon if anything were to not work. Thomas, warm welcome to Researcher's Desk. Thank you so much, Alastair. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me. And um, I'm very excited to talk about this thing. Um, we've been waiting for this seminar for a long time. We had to wait for the press release to come out, and it came out uh, just um, last week, last Monday. It was a press release about this thing when we released everyone who is involved and so on. Um, yes. Um, so I will talk about a few things. Um, I will focus on these things, how to ensure quality and neutrality, because doing a climate, climate assembly, sometimes called citizen climate assembly, it uh, it is it's a big large it's it's a large endeavor, and um, we want to do this in a professional way, and there are many things to think about, and it's quite complex and it's quite uh, expensive to do this right. So who are we? I mean, Fairtrans do, doing this. It's a big program financed by Formas and Mistra. And it's about climate action together with the Swedish civil society. And we had good contacts with them, with the broad grassroots organizations in Sweden involving five million members. Three and a half of the million members are the ones, the trade unions to the left, the four central organizations for trade unions. Um, well, Ledana is, is their own trade union for, 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 um, different um, <clears throat> CEOs and leaders in in um, in Sweden and then we have Hyresgästföreningen the, the for the organization for, for the ten tenants in Sweden and the Naturskyddsföreningen Society for Nature and finally Hela Sverige ska leva which is a very important rural organization they actually organize about half a million or even more people in the rural area so it's very important to have them on board so we collaborate very well with all these main seven actors. And then there's a bunch of other people, other organizations, which uh, do not have so many members. They might be like Sveriges Konsumenter. It's an it's umbrella organization for different organizations and so on. So this is Fairtrans. And so basically we collaborate with civil society in Sweden to make them step up in the leadership to show what ordinary people want. What do what do the people in Sweden actually want? What kind of climate politics? Because uh, this is the way to revitalize um, parliamentary democracy or representative democracy. It's not a way to replace it, but it's to to vitalize it to come up with new ideas. What people would think if they have time to think. One thing what we have done is um, some of you know that uh, Stockholm Silla Center has been giving a course, executive course for business leaders for the last four years where business leaders have been listening to Joan Rockström and Kate Rayworth and other <clears throat> prominent researchers um, to get the latest research on, on climate issues and uh, resilience and biodiversity and so on. So we're trained business leaders and um, the Wallenberg brothers and so on. Many of the CEOs and the big corporations have taken this course. So now I'm gonna say to our trade union leaders, would you like to take a similar course? They said, yes. If Wallenberg has taken this course, we also want to take this course. So they got, um, for a smaller price, they have taken the same course now. They are doing it now um, for a just transition. So this is the way we try to, to make, to increase self-confidence in, in the trade unions so they feel they can also uh, discuss climate change and other sustainability issues uh, based on science. Uh, and this has turned out very well. I've been super happy. We had a fantastic days out on the on the conference hotel with the leaders of the central organizations and leaders from many other organizations. So that's basically what we do in fair trans. But then we also realized that civil society organizations are often seen as the organized elite. 
especially among climate skeptics. Um, they think that all of these institutions, all these um, uh, civil society organizations, they are part of the of the elite structure in Sweden, and that means they are not supposed to. Um, I want to admit someone who came late. I disappeared. They're not supposed. They don't represent the. They don't represent ordinary people. So there's in Sweden there's a word called vanliga människor, ordinary people, and um, the the nationalist party tries to claim that we know what ordinary people want and who they are. And these everyday people, um, to get a sense what they what so this is the the unorganized people in Sweden. They, they do not belong to. Uh, grassroots organizations with democratic uh, statutes and so on, but they are unorganized. So for, for this right-wing people or nationalist people to 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 reach them or to to make it more compelling, uh, saying what people want, it's not enough to just uh, or to collaborate with trade unions and um, other kind of established organizations. So that's why we're doing this uh, climate assembly. This is the reason why we do it. And Tim Daw has been talking about this before. With um, um, he had he had a presentation for research desk in March. So I will not take the theory of what, what um, deliberate meaning public is about, but it's about what people think when they have time to make up their minds in deliberation with, with each other after listening to experts, various experts, and. It's a democratic lottery, and it's a lottery, but it's based on scientific principles for making sure that the people uh, mirror population. So it's not completely random, because if it was totally random, we would get people uh, who were self-selecting. I mean, not everyone wants to spend eight days discussing climate politics. And if you want a uh, fashion, it if you want um, uh, uh, um Everyday people, I mean, they have to, to not representing, but but we have, if we, if we want to have really mirror the population, we need to make lots of different sampling techniques to make sure that we have a good sample of people. And they will make deliber deliberation, that they will suggest some propos proposals, and finally, in the final weekend, they will vote for these propositions. So there will be individual votes. And uh, so we can see how many percentage of, of the assembly that supports different propositions. Many countries have done this. Um, and there's been a diversity of mandates and budgets in, the, in these different uh, national assemblies. And uh, we have contacts, uh, Tim Doha's strong contacts with, with, with Knokka, uh, leading network to make sure that this is done in a, in a scientifically rigorous way. So, what do we do? <clears throat> what do we do then? A mini public, um, just to repeat what, what Tim Dore said last time. Um, one of the aim is to reduce polarization. Because when people meet without um, ordinary lobbyists, without ordinary political representations, they don't have any strong mandates, or some, some might have um, a strong man, um mandate or agenda, they, do, they meet without an agenda. So they are more open to listen to different experts and they're open to, to have a fact-based discussion thanks to the different experts they listen to. And uh, they address particularly moral and ethical concerns because they don't have expertise in any of the subjects, usually ordinary people, but they have expertise on what they think is fair, what is a fair deal. How should we allocate and distribute the different benefits and the cost of the transformation? Um, for example, if you increase petrol prices, uh, how do you compensate uh, low-income people? So this is the way to, to address um, this thing. And there are no lobbyists in the room. There, there's no organized um, lobbyist or power relations based on economic or political power. And uh, the, we found in, in previous research that 
it will be considered public input on complex value-laden problems and trade-offs. And uh, the result is, is, is not so much technical. They, they will not maybe come up to, with some very technical solutions. But uh, we hope still that it will be tangible results uh, in, the, in the proposals they come up with. Um, any questions so far about um, deliberate mini publics in um, in theory? We can take some questions now. I think. Okay. Thank you so much for the questions on on the general stuff. Now we're going to this medborg on klimatet. What we're doing here in Stockholm and Sweden, uh, starting in in March. So the national assemblies have been conducted in several countries, but not in Sweden. And fair transport. Um, because it's a Mr. program I'm, I'm leading with Stefan Bartel, we, they decided to organize this in Sweden in spring 2022. It's important to know this because this was before the national election. So we did not do this in response to the election, the result of the election. So please don't think that we've done this uh, somehow because the government is what it is. Um, this is a, an idea that is very interesting for researchers and in many countries. So we, we had this, this discussions for the last two years. So we start in March next year, two weekends in Stockholm. Between that is four online meetings on Saturdays. And um, uh, previous experience has shown that if you manage to get the attention uh, during your first um, fiscal meeting, then people will be willing to participate on online meetings. And they're also giving 1,000 kroner per, per day in the meeting. Um, to make sure that even people who are not interested in climate politics, they will also participate. So we, we enrolled Anket Fabriken. It's a very complicated public procurement, as you know, Stockholm University. But we enrolled in Anket Fabriken for selecting participants. And then we have another consultancy called Digitum Lab. They won the second uh, upphandling in public procurement. So they will lead and facilitate the whole assembly. So the first risk that, that we have been observing is that <laughs> Actually, the climate assembly is ignored by the political system. In other countries, uh, the political system, governments, or parliament have been instrumental when they when they when they start the assembly. So they have been actually ordering the assembly. Here, we are a bunch of universities doing it. So we need to interact with media to make sure that media gets interested. Uh, then politicians might be interested also, and we have to ensure the participants feel that they own the process and. They are free to just suggest whatever policies they like. So this is not researchers deciding uh, um, policies and so on. So we want the political system to understand that this is what a, a, a random group of people, uh, citizens, will actually come up with. So we hope that the politicians will be interested in these things. So it's the it's the end result, the the, the proposals and the voting for the proposals. That is, um, we focus on. We don't focus on how much they learn during the process. That's also interesting. We do that also. But the main thing is that we want this to have political traction. And we want them to elect a few spokespersons who can take this further. So it will continue for another few months, and maybe six months. They can get some compensation for traveling around and, and telling about the results and so on. So that's the way we're trying to make sure that the whole thing is not ignored just because it's a university-led assembly. So it's quite di different from most countries. Another problem or potential risk is that uh, the assembly is hijacked by special interest groups. We know that uh, there are some um, organizations in Sweden who love this idea, who have been proposing this idea. Um, and um, if we collaborated with these people, these organizations, it would um, risk our and neutrality, of course. So we have to somehow say, yes, we know that you're interested in these things, but um, what we're doing now is totally independent of what you are interested in or what you want to do. So we want to keep our integrity as a university-led climate assembly. We also know that there are some groups who are against this, either for political reasons or for scientific reasons. There are some... Um, political scientists who are skeptical to this whole idea of asking a bunch of people. And they say that the parliament is already representing people. So we don't need to have any kind of strange thing trying to, um, trying to 
go past past the parliament. So there are some ideas from from political scientists who are skeptical to the whole idea, but we usually try to reassure them, saying that our idea is not to replace um, to replace uh, parliamentary and representative democracy. It's actually to inform them about uh, um, what people would think if they are not in the hands of the ordinary lobbyist structure and the power structure and so on. But as you said, uh, one of your questions before, um, I forgot your name, we have to ensure quality and non-bias in the selection of participants and the selection of experts. So how do we do that? Well, first to take the participants. We want to have 50 participants, and that's a small sample. We cannot say that they, rep they represent the people in Sweden. Uh, there are too few of that, too much, much too few people to represent um, to be representative of Sweden. So we cannot use that word. So instead, we say that we try to mirror the population. And then we know that if we, if we just do the first poll, we ask people to come and we say, oh, whoever shows interest in is welcome. We know that this is called a self-selected sample. They will not represent the people of Sweden. Uh, sorry, they will not mirror the people of Sweden. <laughs> Uh, because there will be people who are interested in these issues. And we also want to have people who are not interested in climate politics, climate issues. So that's why we pay them 1,000 kroner per day. Um, <laughs> it's actually a big part of the budget. And we have to pay the tra travels and hotels to Stockholm also for, for the two weekends. Then the, the enquete fabriken, they use seven variables in selection. Uh, geography, sex, and age, they know that ex ante before they send out the first survey. So they send out a survey to 5,000 people, perhaps. And then they ask in the survey for education, uh, which party they would vote for. If it was election today, very common question. Um, if they're climate climate warrior on a scale one to seven, and foreign background, because we want to have, I mean, if 30% of the people in Sweden have foreign background, that means at least one parent is born, sorry, um, both of your parents are born abroad or you are born abroad, then you have a foreign background. Uh, so we ask these questions in the in the survey. And then they, they use different um, uh, statistical, statistical techniques to make sure that the 50 or 60 people, because we need some reserves that are selected, um, <clears throat> One of one of five would actually support to uh, Democraterna, and one of five supporting Moderaterna, and uh, yeah, twenty five percent or thirty percent Social Democraterna, and so on. So they mirror the parliament somehow. I think that is the most important way to get legitimacy in in the general population. So the people will question us: Ah, who are these fifty people? Can they really represent the the, the citizens of Sweden? Well, at least they mirror the the, the parliament. That will be our answer to ensure legitimacy. So we do not, we, we understand that many people who are climate activists who really want to participate, but we have to say no to, to many of these people and to get people with short education and people with less, less climate warrior and so on. So this will be solved. I mean, there are statistical ways and there are scientific articles written on these things. And Tim Daw is making these discussions with the with, um, and Katarikin to make sure these things. They are very, very interested in, in, in doing this in a scientific way. Finally, we have recruited a consultancy group. So the members, eight people, quite well-known people in Sweden, representing different political parties and so on. And they are <clears throat> they would oversee that the selection of participants is non-biased and also the selection of, of experts which is the next question, number four here. Um, how do we make sure that the experts we invite are not biased? Um, for the first weekend, of course, we have to invite a lot of ex some experts. We will discuss either international and national issues of fairness, or we discuss um, transportation and mobility issues because that is one of the important fields that we have. We need some policies on transportation and mobility. So we're not, we're not exactly decided which will be the themes for the first weekend, but we will need to, to invite some experts. And then we will use the consultation group <coughs> to consult them to make sure that they think 
the selection of experts is not biased. So here we have uh, Bengt Westerberg, who was the former leader of Folkpartiet. Um, and we have Lena Sommerstad, she was the Minister of Environment for the Social Democrats. Um, PM Nilsson, he made a short career for Moderaterna. And now he, he will be the leader of Timbro. We have Jens Holm from the Vänsterpartiet. He is now in the municipality, municipality in Stockholm. He was in the parliament before. Ulrika Liljeberg, Centre Party in the parliament. Anita Sandström, who is representing the Sami, Sami parliament. Uh, <coughs> Carolina Klyft, Olympic champion. And Silvia Kakembo from Arena Idea. So this is a ran not random. This is a sample to cover to make sure that this, this group um, will somehow help us if we are blind to our own bias, they will help us say that, no, 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 you need to have some, you cannot use fairness all the time in this sense, you must use fairness, you must use uh, maybe fairness and efficiency and climate efficiency, pol efficient and fair policy tools, for example, not just um, talk too much about fairness because that could be a leftist connotation. So they will, they will help us with the communication and uh, also mm. which experts we invite. So this is the way we are trying to, to ensure unbiased. And we are quite happy with this, but maybe you can help us, you guys, if there's anything that we have not been thinking about. Um, finally, the, the risk is that many participants will quit before or after the first meeting. Uh, they say, oh, yes, I can participate these eight days. And then, oh, actually, no, I have too many other commitments and uh, weddings and so on. So from other assemblies, there have been a bit of dropout before the first meeting. Then actually, if you manage to get the attention from the people in the first meeting, they usually will prioritize to continue as participants. So we have to invite 55 or 60 participants to ensure that at least 50 will continue because we don't want less than 50 in to, to finalize the whole assembly. And then we want to have two ambassadors, two popular ambassadors. We're thinking about a TV personality to make sure that participants feel that, oh, we can actually meet meet some, some famous people here. And th this is high status because there's some, uh, some uh, melody festival leader, some, yeah, some popular TV profile. So we're trying to get one such person or even two, maybe a deputy, to be ambassadors, so they can talk to them at the meetings. If they have, um, if they have questions about um, some things, they can come there with complaints. So they're, yeah. Otherwise, it is the Didim Lab who is facilitating and leading the assemblies. So again, it's not us researchers who are leading it because that would be a bit. Um, it could be a bias that we want to impose our ideas on policies and our ideas on, yeah. We're already on, <laughs> we're already influencing the whole agenda by by deciding very much experts. Um, even though the, the if a majority of participants say that they want to they want to invite uh, John Hustler, for example, uh, then of course we will accept them to do that. And if they want to invite uh, Elsa Widding, well, I don't think a majority want to invite her. <laughs> but hypothetically. If a majority wants to invite her, then I think we have to accept that, to invite Elsa Wilding. So we have to be open to, to say that this is you, you own this process to participants. Uh, our theory of impact is that we cannot, we have, as researchers, we cannot influence the government very much or parliament, other than our ordinary business with research and so on. But if the parliament, the government feels that this is somehow independent process, that we give all this um, um, all this um, capacity building with 50 ordinary people in Sweden, and they come up with this thing, and it's their process, and it's their proposals. And we ask the then we ask the politicians and government, are you interested to listen to these participants who, who are somehow citizens of Sweden? So we contacted them now already with the press release and so on, and asked them if they're interested. And some parties have answered, yes, we're interested. And they even invited us to come to talk more about these things to them so they know what is the difference between meaning public and uh, opinion poll and uh, are we threatening representative, representative democracy and so on. 
and how do we solve these biases and so on. So we will we have been invited by some parties to discuss these things, and we have been support we have found supporting emails from different parties saying that this is a good idea and we are interested to listen to these 50 people when they come up with ideas. So it's very important that it's open. We are we don't decide which mm -hmm. are the proposed proposals they will make. So that our theory of change or theory of, of um, in, impact is that attention by media is absolutely vital for politicians to show any interest. Why should politicians be interested in what 50 people think? Just because we say that, oh, we educated 50 people, now can you listen to them? So we think that we have to get the interest from, from, from media. So we hope that we get some connection with television also. And um, yeah, public media, mainstream media, and, and the social media, and so on. So we got in Dagens Nyheter, there was one, I think it was one whole page, when the, when they talked about, um, say, that Sverige får ett nationellt medborgare för klimatfrågor. So they interviewed Tim Daw, who was leading this. So Tim Daw, he, he is a colleague of mine, um, his background in ecology and political, political science. And because he is Scottish and uh, this kind of deliberate mean public is very common in the UK. Um, he knows a lot about these things and then he's learned many things. So he's, he's leading this process. <laughs> okay, finally, do you have any questions? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Thomas. And before everyone turns their videos on, I'm just going to turn off the recording. Yes. Uh, thanks for a super talk, Thomas.